Breaking news, Dr. Scott Stripling has discovered the oldest known Hebrew inscription ever found in Israel. It's a couple hundred years older than the oldest we once had, which has the name Yahu or Yahweh on this inscription. It's talking about cursings. And here I interview him. We have a difference of ontology at the end of the day. Maybe our epistemology is a bit different as well. But let me tell you something. He's a great guy. And I can't wait to learn more from him. But also I plan on having voices of others who might have a different way of looking at this in the future. Let's give congratulations to him for the hard work that they've been doing in this discovery. And who knows what else we haven't found. We are Myth Vision. Today, some breaking news has come out, and I have Dr. Scott Stripling with me today to talk about the oldest known Hebrew inscription ever known, discovered in Israel. Welcome to Myth Vision. How are you, my friend? Hey, Derek. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I uh, look forward to learning from you what we can know that isn't published yet because <laughs> i'm sure you know some things you can't tell yet until publications so um just let me know if you plead the fifth at times i get it uh because sometimes i might probe deep and try to figure out things but um first and foremost i want our audience to know who you are you've never been on myth vision and uh dr scott stripling serves as the provost at the bible seminary in katie houston texas and as the director of excavations for the associates for biblical research at Kerbet El Makatir, I hope I'm saying it correct, and Shiloh, Israel. Scott is a sought after speaker at churches, conferences, and seminars, and today he's joining us. So thank you so much. What did we, I almost want to join you and say, what did we find? <laughs> like, I'm excited about this. What is it that you discovered? Well, no, I like the way you joined in. Uh, John F. Kennedy once said that. Failure is an orphan, but success has many fathers. And so uh, um, there are truly many people to to credit that were, you know, part of my team and the sacrifice and that help us to, to bring this to fruition. But what we did essentially was to go back and wet sift using a new technology and old excavations dump piles from the 1980s. And in the process of doing that, we recovered uh, a curse tablet, a small folded lead tablet called a depixio, which is folded about only two by two centimeters. And this stylistically, we knew what it was. And I thought I saw with the naked eye, glyptic remains on the outside, but lead, you know, how do you, how do you scan through <laughs> lead? Um, ultimately we did find a lab in Prague, Czechoslovakia that had a track record for doing this. And they had published other things that they had scanned through. And so long story short, we were able to uh, do thousands of scans on the tablet. And then with post post processing, we were able to recover text from the inside. Wow. There's a lot of questions there that I suspect uh, you would, people are going to ask, but first of all, congratulations. I want to say you. that again, this is exciting. I love finding out stuff about this big fan of biblical uh, material and finding out more about what is the truth? Where is the stuff coming from? Yeah. And of course, uh, someone who has a faith background as yourself, this would play a pivotal a motivational factor in your research and, and, and maybe even just kind of validates in your, in your mind, the background you have, but without going there in particular, I want to ask some more about this stuff. I'm no archeologist. Dr. James D. Tabor did post about this. For those hmm. who haven't seen his blog, go check out his blog. He actually has a few images on there that are showing you what is released right now pertaining to what is found of the tablet. And it's a folded, what is that? It's a folded tablet? Lead tablet, yeah. It's just, a, it was four by two centimeters, but folded in half, it becomes two by two centimeters. Ah, okay, that's interesting. So how common are those, uh, finding a folded tablet? Well, it's they're, they're not that uncommon, but they're usually from later time periods that, that right. we have found them. And many times they're not found because, for example, Professor Zedfau's team, although he was a great archaeologist, they missed it. You know, they, they sifted everything and they missed it. And it's only when you're using wet sifting. So we wash everything after we dry sift it. Then we have a, a, a machine that we have built that we then wash the material and then check it again. 
And I think there are a lot more of these out there, but they're probably in the dump piles. They've been missed in the past. I can't wait to find more if we do. But uh, yeah. this is a great discovery. Uh, you can watch the video. Of course, they, there's a press conference where he's actually releasing what is being said on this. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But my question is wet sifting, right? We have a few skeptics who are already contesting this whole thing. And, you know, I spoke to Dr. Tabor and he said, no, wet sifting is a a professional method in trying to find these things out. So maybe for our audience who doesn't know, what is wet sifting and uh, how does that process work? Back in the 1930s, uh, James Starkey at La Quiche, a very famous site in Israel, second largest site in Israel in the Iron Age, uh, Starkey was brilliant uh, in his time. And he's the one who first came up with this idea to wash the material. And it was revolutionary, but Starkey died an untimely death. And he, I think he was so far ahead of his time that his colleagues and students did not, and because it's time consuming and expensive, probably they did not keep doing it. And then literally the institutional memory was lost. And it wasn't until about maybe 18 years ago that the Temple Mount Sifting Project in Jerusalem that Gabi Barkai founded um, began to wash material that was out of context from some destruction that had been done on the Temple Mount. I worked as a supervisor on their project um, and became a big believer in, in wet sifting. And I made up my mind that when I had the opportunity that I was going to employ it in the field. And so like at Shiloh, we wash everything in situ. So we know exactly where it came from. But I still thought there would be great value in going through dumps from the past. So mm -hmm. in short, what we do, we excavate, then we dry sift in a sieve to let up the soil fall through so that we can see what's in it. And then we check the best we can what's in there. And then normally 99% of excavations going on right now, normally that is then dumped and that's the end of it. Mm. What we do is we take that material and we run it down a funnel into a a colored bag that corresponds to that square and that section of the square. We label it. We take it to our washing station and we keep the tag with it. So we know where it came from. We wash it and then you can see unbelievable things. And in my tests that I had done, Derek, I'd gone back to uh, old dumps from the 1980s and the 1920s. And I was finding in their dump four times as many small finds like scarabs and bula, for example, glyptic remains. For every one that they published, I was finding four in their dump. And this was astonishing. Wow. This means that we've been throwing away 80% of the evidence of the small finds in the past. And so this just is revolutionary because if somebody says, well, we excavated at Megiddo or wherever, and we did not find evidence that supported the Bible. Well, I guess not when you're throwing away 80% of the evidence, you know? Yeah. So it's, it has huge ramifications. What we did was to take Zertal's dump pile to take it through this process that I'm describing. And through that process is how we recovered the tablet. I want to address our skeptic friends out here. And I am one, right? So I'm somebody who might have a different interpretation at the end of the day about some of this material. But I do want them to understand, I don't think they'd be so critical if this, if you were standing here and you were actually William Deaver right now, or if you were, uh, let's say, uh, Israel Finkelstein or something, they'd be like, oh, let's listen to this guy, you know, and they wouldn't have so many issues. So I wish we would kind of drop our prejudices of people from their backgrounds. You admittedly are a maximalist. You believe that the Bible is the word of God and that it can guide us in a way. I've talked to Aaron Mayer, who's a great archaeologist and a good friend of mine as well. And he's like, you know, some of these guys want to throw the Bible out completely. And I don't see why it's not a tool. I mean, you may not necessarily want to just grab it and look at it in Xerox and go, oh, this must be exactly. But it is a method that he thinks that they're undermining themselves on not allowing it to be a tool. Listen, so, Derek, you've yeah. got to. In that part of the world, the Bible is our go-to source. And so even those who, it makes them very nervous, the term biblical archaeology, like it or not, most of the sites that we are excavating in the southern Levant are not mentioned in Mesopotamia. They're not mentioned in the Egyptian literature. It's only the biblical text. Mount Ebal is only mentioned in the Bible. That is all we have. Well, guess what? It's mentioned that there's an altar. The altar is there. And now we have the textual verification of it. So this is getting into some interesting stuff. This is where I really like that we're heading already. Um, <laughs> as far as the text that was on this, 
Um, Paleo Hebrew is a pretty old version of Hebrew. From what I understand, Hebrew as we know it, it kind of took on this uh, Aramaic spin, if you will, during the Babylonian exile Mm -hmm. post. Pre that, you have Paleo Hebrew. And then this is a little older than that kind of Hebrew. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So this is when you have a, a language like Middle Egyptian and it's based on hieroglyphic symbols. You have hundreds of them, you know, maybe 500, 600. I don't remember the exact number, but it's hundreds of hieroglyphic symbols in in Middle Egyptian. If Moses, let's say hypothetically that Moses uh, did write the Pentateuch, the first five books of the the Hebrew Bible, um, it would have taken him a library to write it with all of those symbols. Right. Because it wasn't phonetic. But when you develop a phonetic alphabet, now in a very truncated fashion, you can write. Um, And so when those symbols begin to take on sound qualities, like an ox head Mm -hmm. becomes the Hebrew Aleph, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And we have a bunch of those in our inscription. Now you've got the beginnings of something. And this happens in this late Bronze One period when... the the first phonetic alphabet begins to emerge. It's Egyptian symbols that are becoming the Hebrew alphabet. Wow. And it's, it's fascinating. So what we call that, okay, well, it's different ways. The most generic term would be proto alphabetic. That way you're not going to offend anybody. (laughs) Proto alphabetic. It's the earliest version. Okay. But you know, if you find it down in the Sinai, scholars call it proto Sinaitic. If you find it, uh, usually in Israel proper, they call this proto-Canaanite, right. but I'm not willing to do that anymore because this is not proto-Canaanite. This is proto-Hebrew. So in a, in a generic sense, we'll call it proto-alphabetic, but let's be clear, this pre-Paleo-Hebrew text is proto-Hebrew. Interesting. Okay, okay. So let's prove, let's go into something else here, the dating. There's a couple things you mentioned, right? You found this in a, in the I guess a dump site in the east side, which was where the altar was from a 1980s dump area. And my question is like, how do we get to the dating? Are they are are scholars looking at this? And I know that it'll probably be published and they're going to go into extensive detail probably to verify and, and explain. But how do we get to the dating on this particular find? Is it the language? Is it a combination of the language and a layer? Do we know what layer this really came from if it was found in a dump? Ooh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. Great question. Uh, when Zartal excavated, there were only two strata. There was a late Bronze Age strata, and there's an Iron Age strata, and that's it. So your only two choices are like LB two, late Bronze Age, and uh, the very beginning of the Iron Age. That's it. What so, date for our audience who's not an, like uh, aware of times? Can you put us a, a terminus ad quo, terminus okay. ad quim? You know what I mean? Sure. So he thought that the site was occupied from about 1250 to 1150 BC. Okay. So the end of the late bronze age, the beginning of the iron age. Um, I think it's probably a little older than that based on my analysis of the pottery. But anyway, for now, let's just say LB2, um, iron age one in that, that horizon. So then the inscription falls within that time frame and right. even at even at the far end of it it's still the oldest uh, that that we have and i think that it's more to more to the early side but even at the far, far side it's still the earliest right so, specific answer to your question is there's three ways that we could date it number one is the archaeological context that it came from number two is the epigraphy the style of letters which i'm calling proto-alphabetic and there's many, many parallels uh, that exist of that that we'll be publishing. And then number three, the metallurgy. So we had the lead tested and the lead, Professor Nama Yahalomak from Hebrew University performed the analysis. And the lead was from a, an area in the Aegean in what we would today call Greece, Lavrion. And the mines there are known for their, their lead mines. Wow. And we have many objects from antiquity that came from certain mines. And chemically, we could tell which ones came from where. My point is that that mine was in use during the late Bronze Age II period, okay? So it doesn't rule it out. It can't prove absolutely that, you know, it's it's LB2, but it would be consistent with what you would expect. So those are the three metrics we're dealing with. 
So technically, the older date is in favor on your side so far as it looks. And if mm. we were giving the people who are like, I don't want it to be older, uh, <laughs> what's what's the what's the newest, I guess, date you would put? And how much older is that? Even if you grant the minimal approach to that, what is how much older is it that the oldest found? I think isn't it William Deaver's find? I'm not I'm not certain. What is the oldest one prior to this discovery? And if you weren't even granting your maximal approach, what would the gap be still? Well, I mean, most people would talk about the Kayafa Ostrakhan. That would be Garfinkel at Kerbic Kayafa would sort of look to that around 1000. You know, recently we have a new inscription that's the, the Zerubbabel inscription that may be 100 years earlier than that. Um, and an even more recent one that people are grappling with, it's not published, the Lakish Milk Bowl Ostrakhan that, you know, can fall into that. But as far as sort of established scholarship that everyone has accepted at this point would be the Kayaf Ostrakhan. That's about 1000 BC. And Derek, let me say this. I'm more, much, much more comfortable talking about, from my perspective, the weight of evidence lands here. Right. I'm not out to, if somebody disagrees, they have a different opinion, that's fine. I mean, we, we have a saying where there are two archaeologists, there are three opinions. Isn't and that a joke? Hold, <laughs> and sometimes I hold two of them simultaneously myself. You know, I'm arguing with myself. I, I understand that these are complex issues. Yeah. And so I wish in academia that we would be more you know, like this, that, hey, it could be this, it could be that. But in my view, the weight of evidence pushes it pushes it this way. Right. Uh, I think we far too often people are trying to, you know, put us into extreme camps and like, you know, we don't have common ground. Um, I talked with Bill Deaver about this last year. I was speaking at a, he and I were together speaking at a conference in Albuquerque and I presented on this topic. I didn't have the full text yet at that point, but I mean, he was very open to, to the possibility of what I was presenting. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I was just trying to get the, the, kind of an idea of where in discoveries this would be dated. If yeah. yours is correct, this is, a, I mean, this really is groundbreaking, even if it wasn't, but it is, it seems that the evidence is leaning that way. So if I could get into some of the details that I think is relevant, first off, Mount Ebal, okay? So this is a biblical cited uh, place where Joshua's altar would have been. And whatever your approach is to this, we have a text that's validating something like this would be going on. And when we look in Joshua, we find some interesting things. When we look in Deuteronomy, we find some interesting things about curses and blessings. So right there, we're on the same footing. There's something going on. So I'd like to get into the context without mention of Moses, Joshua, Israel, the division of tribes and the book of Deuteronomy. How do you imagine this artifact connects to Deuteronomy 27 and Joshua 8? And how would you describe the artifact relative to the biblical texts? Moses had, had commanded the Israelites, when you cross over, and this is at a place called Shittim, Joshua 2.1, Joshua 3.1, Numbers 25.1, modern Tal al-Hamam, where I excavated a number of years with the team there. Um, Moses writes the book of Deuteronomy there, we suppose, and then he goes up on Mount Nebo and he dies. Joshua leads the Israelites across the land. When you come into the land and you gain a foothold, you're going to go to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. You're going to pronounce blessings from Mount Gerizim, and you're going to pronounce curses from Mount Ebal. Now, he didn't have to explain to them that they were renewing covenant. They knew that. That's how covenant was made in the late Bronze Age. And we have many examples of this. The suzerain Hittite treaties that are in existence. This is well known. Um, I wrote a, a book called The Power of Covenant in Times of Crisis three years ago, not knowing we were going to have this discovery. And I write on, you know, the point, the five points of a late Bronze Age covenant. The fourth one is blessings and curses. And so what you do is you bind yourself to the covenant. If I keep the terms of this covenant, these blessings will be mine. If I violate the terms of the covenant, these are the consequences with which I'm going to deal. So what do they do? They have victory at Jericho. They have victory at Ai, a site I spent many years excavating. And then they go north and they do it. Then Joshua, they do what Moses told them to do in Deuteronomy 27. Six of the tribes on Mount Gerizim pronouncing blessings, six of the tribes on Mount Ebal pronouncing curses. And then Joshua 8.30 says that Joshua built an altar on Mount Ebal there to the Lord. Okay, so Zertal finds in, uh, and excavates from 82 to 89 a round, small round altar that's two by two meters. On top of it is a large rectangular altar at the perfect geometric center 
of, of it. It's to protect and to venerate that earlier altar. That later, more grand rectangular altar has gotten a lot of the attention, but that's not that's not the key. It's the earlier one underneath it. That's Joshua's altar, and uh, many of us believe that that dates back to the the beginning of LB two. Others who take a, a late date of the Exodus, for example, may think that it comes to a later part in LB two. But it's that round altar that that Joshua. If you if you're going to take the text, right, um, right, value yeah. that Joshua would have uh, would have sacrificed on. So uh, it's interesting you said something that I just want to like side note. Other than my little list of questions that I thought would be fascinating, this makes me think of the Hyksos expulsion, and then this also makes me kind of go to this later idea. Which position do you favor, if you don't mind me asking? Oh sure, um, I mean there's a new book out. Um, well, it's a year old now, but Zondervan's new text. Is it the five views. Yeah, the five views. And yeah. I mean, I wrote chapter one. So, you know, there's there's my view right there. Right. It's all in black and white in chapter one. I took the, the early date of the Exodus and I explain in my chapter why I think the archaeological evidence strongly supports that. And then, you know, and I love that that format because there's four other authors that get to critique me and I get to respond and then we do the same thing to the other views. It's a great learning tool. Thank you for that. I just figure I'd get our contacts for the audience also to understand this would be that Hyksos position uh, in an earlier context, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Isn't there this are, 15th um, century? 15th century BC. Okay, but when I when I'm 1400 is we're saying up, about 1400. So okay. the transition from LB1 into LB2. Those who are are taking that the Hyksos expulsion from Egypt is the Exodus. That's a whole other theory that's Got not it. in five views. That's, okay. That's a, a, a sub view, if you will. So I didn't read that entire book. I read uh, Hindle. Chapter, chapter one. Don't worry about the other chapter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do need to go visit it again, though, just to check it out. So, uh, context in, in particular, when I read the list of curses in Deuteronomy twenty-seven, these fit very, barely, barely clearly, if you will, within the specific program of the Deuteronomic Law Code, which most scholars consider to be a product of a much later period, eighth to sixth century. Do you consider the artifact reflective of something much earlier that was later developed within the text, or do you have a different explanation? No, I think it's very consistent with an early text. And take that, the one detail, Joshua built an altar on Manival. How could an author, 600, 700, 800 years later, how could he have possibly known a detail like that? Because it's been covered now for 500, 600 years. They, they, the altar at Mount Eval was intentionally buried and taken out of service. How's some guy going to know that six or seven, 800 years later? So, so when you get eyewitness details like that and they're everywhere, it suggests to me that, that there's a very early writing. Okay. And now we have the ability to do it. We have proof of an alphabetic script from that time. And that's actually what your discovery is kind of showing too. It's like this language is, is actually aware or there. So the question then becomes kind of like with the text we have, kind of like today, right? We have a, a Septuagint of a Hebrew Bible. It's like they later are kind of rewriting what you're suggesting was earlier. You're, you're suggesting you think there was a Deuteronomy that may have originally been written in something what we see is much older. Yes. And um, so Joshua is commanded to write, they're at Mount Eval to plaster a stone, cover, take a big stone, cover it with plaster, and write the words of the law on that. Well, that implies that he's literate and that people are going to be able to read it. So there's a general perception of illiteracy. So Zertal, in his, in his excavation, recovered a large amount of plaster. Hmm. Um, and he saved it. Now, of course, uh, it's the late professor Zertal. He died a few years ago without completing a final publication, unfortunately. He saved that and it is now going to be analyzed with flat surfaces on some of that plaster. There was no technology in the 1980s, like infrared and ultraviolet lighting, for example, to examine that plaster. Now we can expose it to that. And uh, wouldn't this be phenomenal if uh, if it's examined and you, you also have written script on that? Wow. So that would essentially prove, if, if, you're, if that's not too strong of a word, that uh, that it was written in the period that the text indicates it was written. Wow, that will be really interesting to find all of these things come together. So reliability, do you consider it's problematic that the inscription does not correspond to the text of Deuteronomy 27? I mean, like, for example, um, 
very inerrant, infallible verbatim, you know, uh, this text that you found, if you don't mind, tell us what is it that was said on this cursing um, tablet, this folded tablet. And then if you don't mind, like, how does that correspond? If we don't have that text mm. in our Bible, let's say it's just, um, how, how do we, how do we see that? Is it reliable? Well, I, I think it's a, a literary f formulation. It's really a summary of all the curses because you've got, it's a legally binding document. Just think of marriage. Okay. When a couple gets married, they legally, it's a legal contract. And when they say vows to each other, though, that's the blessing and the curses, you know, all the benefits of marriage that you're going to get. And then the negative consequences, if you violate those, those vows, you know, right. It's enunciated, so it's it's a it's a legally binding contract. I think our cursed tablet is uh, is a summary of all the curses that are mentioned in there. And so, what it says, your sec second half of your question, is um, the, the word arur in Hebrew is curse, and so that word is used repeatedly. Cursed, 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 cursed by the God Yahweh, and there you have the divine covenant name of God used. And this is by far the earliest mention of Yahweh uh, in the land of Israel. And you will surely die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Cursed, 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 you will die. So it's it's what we call a chiastic parallelism. So it's an inversion. It's stating the same thing and then reversing it or juxtaposing it. So it's really beautiful. It's a, it has a literary structure uh, to it as well. So this is almost like a, a if someone's going to summarize something today, biblically, you're, you're taking the approach that they're aware of this text. Um, and they're just kind of summarizing these curses by writing this. And of course, giving it to their God. Yeah. I mean, it's tiny tablet. There's no yeah, way they yeah, yeah. <laughs> write everything on it, you know, but I think it summarizes the fact that, and, and let me just make this point, Derek, that tablet is left on an altar. So even though let's say that I'm an Israelite or Joshua or whatever, on behalf of the nation, um, and I'm binding myself to this. I know I'm my human nature. I know I'm going to sin. Okay. I know I'm going to violate the covenant. That's problematic. So where do I leave the tablet on the altar? The altar is a means by which I get around the curse. If I will repent and accept responsibility when I do screw up, um, then Leviticus 17, 11 says through the shedding of blood, there is remission of sin. And so through this sacrificial process, my vertical and horizontal relationships can, can be rectified without me having to die. So the fact that it's a cursed tablet left on an altar gives you the whole picture. That altar, if you don't mind me asking, were there sacrifices done on that altar? Did they find uh, remains of animals? Uh, yes. Um, uh, the, the whole inside of the larger rectangular altar has, has ash and bone of only only clean sacrificial animals. And even inside the round altar itself, there's a, was a layer of, of the ash and the, you know, remnants of bone that were in there too. Wow. Okay. I'm going to throw a, I'm going to throw you my critical non, you know, academic perspective. And I, you know, I've talked to a couple of my friends that are, that are in academia as well. Uh, one of my friends, is Dr. Kip Davis, who's helped, you know, talk with me about some of these ideas and questions. We've kind of come together with some of these interesting things. He said, congratulations as well. He's like, this is really an amazing find. Um, but this is kind of an interpretation. I'm going to lay it out there and get your critical poke holes in it, do whatever you want, or tell us, you know, it's possible, whatever. Um, so from my perspective, a perfectly plausible explanation for the relationship between the artifact and its find at Mount Ebal and the stories in Deuteronomy and Joshua are that the biblical text developed much later from an earlier tradition, which is reflected within the artifact. Was Mount Ebal a mountain of cursing long before the invention of figures like, let's say, Moses and Joshua and the stories about the conquest? This is a question I have, and it's kind of a statement. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, I know you don't agree with that, but is it possible that that, would, that could be the case? It is possible, you know, you would have to then assume a very accurate oral tradition is, has been passed down. Um, here's a couple of things for you to think about, though, because the, the bar keeps moving. Um, we keep getting older examples of written Hebrew, for example. You know, first it was the text was written in the Hellenistic period, and that was no longer sustainable. So it was, you know, the, the, the Persian period or during the days of Josiah. But here's what we have. 
we have the Ketev Hinnom scrolls, the silver scrolls. And so that's seventh century. You have number six. So that's Pentateuch. You know, that's earlier, early writing. So the priestly blessing of number six, we have written in silver. You know, the paper decomposes. Right. It's only when it's on metal, like lead or silver, that, that it survives. That's seventh century. But a century older than that, at a site in the Sinai called Kunti Let Ajrud, uh, we have Pithos A and Pithos B. And you have the famous Yahweh and his Asherah. Right. Uh, description there talking about, you know, got, did God have a wife? But there's the divine name Yahweh, and that's a century older. But what a lot of people don't realize is that also on those pithoi, you have portions of Exodus and Numbers that are written, and that's a century older. So now so that's what, eight, where, where are we at? We're at eight, you said? Eighth century. So the okay. Silver Scrolls are seventh century. Now we go back another century, and we've got portions of the Pentateuch that are in the eighth century. I mean, so how much further can we keep pushing that theory back? You know, now we f we'll find something else, you know, with portions of it. Now we're in the ninth century and then we're in the 10th century. It just, uh, it's possible, but it's problematic as you know, in you're in your know. mind. You're like, this is definitely problematic. I, I don't see why we're not granting it to be older, granting these things to go further back. And, and let me play a, a complete speculation here on this notion as I'm pressing the critic in me, right. To, to make a point, I I've been studying um, the origins of the Quran and Islam and the Islamic tradition wants to say the Quran, you know, was there dictated by Muhammad. Mm -hmm. A lot of academics are saying the Quran's the earliest thing we have in Islam. And it is something they think is early. And a lot of skeptics I hear that are usually fighting back will try to go, no, no, no. And they're like, they can't stand that this could be early. But then in my head, I go, say it did come from Muhammad, for example. Let's grant it. Does that actually validate or prove any of the metaphysical claims of Gabriel, etc., which are later traditions? Um, we find in the biography of Muhammad, et cetera, a couple hundred years later, which would be a later in the day thing. Um, I don't see what the problem is in that respect. Is it possible we could apply that to a skeptic who has a completely different worldview? Let's say they don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the divine, but they're like, you know what? I'm willing to go really old with this. I'll go with Scott and say, you know what? I think that this is actually something that came from Joshua's day. I just Maybe I think these are embellishments about the divine or whatever it might be. Is that an approach that you could say, I can yeah, respect the guy who's willing absolutely. to go for it? And in fact, I think that's a very, that would be a very valid intellectual approach because, you know, for we have Easter coming up very soon. So for those of us who are Christians, you know, we're thinking, and we have artifacts in our museum that are like crucifixion artifacts. And you know, I was telling a group going through our museum last week, I can prove to you that Jesus existed. I mean, that's a historical fact. I can prove to you that he died, when he died, where he died, and how he died. What I cannot prove to you is that he died in your place. You know, that's right. that's a matter of faith. Right. And so take it back to Joshua. You know, there's miracles that are talked about. Maybe you're saying maybe those are embellishments, but that the text is real. Right. I mean, all I can say is here's why I think the text is authentic, but right. I can't prove to you that God, I mean, for Mount Ebal, did you know you're a stone's throw from where the Abrahamic covenant was cut? At I mean, <laughs> it was just right there. And I'll be in Israel in October, by the way. Well, I, I, I wish I was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to Mount Ebal, um, I'll be back in this, in the States by, by then. But do you see what I'm saying? I, yes, I cannot, I can see why someone would come to that conclusion. Maybe these miracles, God came down at this spot. Uh, maybe that's an embellishment, but how do I deny that the text existed at that time? That's that comes to the the other problematic thing I was going to bring up and get your thoughts on before I let you go because this I, there's so much here. I do want to find out when we're going to have this published. Fingers crossed and all that stuff. But uh, you know, one of the things me and Dr. Kip were talking about is we thought were problematic was that whole the view about the reliability of the biblical text that the inscription does not. It's not a biblical inscription, meaning like this is not actually saying, oh, uh, Joshua verse, you know, chapter five, verse eight or whatever. This is especially so in the view of Joshua 8, 34 through 35, which explicitly states that Joshua read only the words that Moses had written, and that he read all of them. Doesn't the artifact rather clearly bring this claim into doubt was the question, or at least the confidence can't be certain. You know, what you're trying to say is, yeah, this isn't a biblical like here is verse such and such from this text, 
you're saying it gives enough off to say it definitely isn't contradictory to it. It, it, it kind of uh, aligns with this idea of cursings and blessings. Do you see why someone like me who would approach us is kind of hesitant to go, did the biblical text actually exist at this time? Or is this possibly an early tradition of cursing and blessings? And the biblical text maybe came a couple of centuries later. Don't know how to approach it. What are your thoughts? <laughs> what are your thoughts? The, the word only is not in there. It doesn't say he only read those words. It just said he read all the words, but not only those words. Okay, this is a literary composition. The Bible has genre. You have to have genre awareness. We have narrative literature. We have uh, prose. We have poetry, epistolary, apocalyptic literature. The Quran, to go back to your previous uh, point, the Quran does not have that. I mean, the Quran has much more of the character. I don't have no problem with the Quran being written early, me personally. Right. Right. Um, but it has the character of uh, dictation. You know, it's uh, like dictated from above, you know, this is this is the way that it was. But in the Bible, you have all this literary variety. We have stories, you know. Um, take Joseph in Egypt, you know, this he's betrayed by his brothers and, you know, he has the opportunity to take vengeance on them, but he forgives them instead. And, you know, the Bible, it doesn't come out and tell you what the moral of the story is. You read the story and you're moved very powerfully emotionally about the power of forgiveness. You do not have that in the Quran. I'm just saying there are different genres of literature. Right, right, right. So the fact that we have a literary construct here, a parallelism, is consistent with the fact that it's biblical. And then finally, the name Yahweh. I mean, how much more biblical can you get than that? This is besides the, the Solib hieroglyph down in Egypt, which is very early. That's LB2 also, uh, the land of the Shasu of Yahweh. So apparently there's a God Yahweh that's worshipped in some land. Right. And then the Pipas that I talked about at Kunti de la Rouge. But now for the first time in Israel from this early day, we have the covenant name of God and only the Hebrews worship Yahweh. That's pretty biblical. This is an interesting point. I'd like to ask you, what do you think is going to become of this? This discovery is amazing. I really, really appreciate your time coming on and, and explaining to me and my audience and taking jabs and, and hanging <laughs> out and all that. Um, what do you think is going to become of this? How is this going to change the outlook, you think, of scholarship in biblical research and archaeology? We hope to have it published by the end of the summer. So we're close Thank to you. completing the publication right now, six more weeks, but then it's got to go through peer review. And then, you know, it takes a little time for the whole publication to happen. So hopefully by the end of the summer, um, the world will know everything that we know, you know, and, and then everybody can argue about it from there. Uh, everybody throw your stones, you know, anyway. So anyway, what was your question? I got sidetracked. <laughs> No, how's this going to change the game? Oh, how's it going to change things? Right. So uh, anyway, once we have it out there, this is an earthquake. Um, it, it will have aftershocks and reverberations for a long time to come. You know, these questions that you and I have talked about today, when was the text composed? And, you know, was there literacy in an earlier period than we previously thought? Um, it's it's pretty huge. And, and there is a synchronism between what we read in the text, at least in this case, between what we read in the text and what we have found in the archeological material. Um, I was asked at the press conference, how big is this? And I said, well, on a scale of one to 10, this is a 10, you know, yeah. it's big. I agree with you. And I like how you put that syncretism, like someone might interpret this and in favor of all the other data that you've talked about as evidence that helps you come to conclusions. Um, that this is like, look, it may not be that this is Joshua chapter eight, verse five, right? Um, but it is absolutely in, in agreement with what we're reading in the biblical text as far as the tradition goes. And I guess it's like, no matter what position you have, we're in agreement at least on that level. And I can't wait to see what becomes of this. I mean, I really do want to venture where the evidence goes. I got to go back and read your chapter and the five views of Exodus just to see how you approach this. I'm wondering if you wish you could rewrite that chapter now that you have this. <laughs> you know, hey, I have, I need to go back and reread it because I talked about Manival in the chapter and I talked about some of the evidence, but we did not yet have what we have now. So I should go back and reread it too. And, and let me let me give you uh, let me get your expertise here. You deal with critics, I'm sure, all the time. What would you say one of your biggest critics are in this field? That if I were to interview them to hear the other side, that's a fair critic because there's mm. some people like we talked about. Someone on Twitter already 
like trying to act like it's all bogus. It's like, come on. Yeah, I, I wish I was smart enough to fake this. I mean, come on. <laughs> but who would you say is your biggest um, academic critic? Um, I guess I could identify myself as a maximalist, although I hate to use you know terms like this because I think in people who haven't been around us think that that means we're narrow minded or fundamentalist or something, and that's right. not the case. But if you're going to use terms like minimalism and, and maximalism, then you certainly have some scholars from a minimalist school of thought. And when I'm interviewed, you know, then usually the person doing the interview will go and get a quote from the other side and they'll come same thing when they're interviewing them, they'll come and get a quote from somebody like me, because I guess that makes good media or help sell or something like that. Right. But um, I'm evading the question. I'll give you a direct <laughs> answer. Um, I mean, I would say a fair person who would be more from the other side might be Deaver. Um, um, you know, Deaver initially did not think Zertal had found an altar on Manival. I mean, you know, he was on the record. But now, you know, over time, I think, shouldn't we all be willing to evaluate and weigh and so forth? Over time, he's, he's, uh, he's willing to you know, except that there very well could be, and he's very interested in our inscription and what it's going to come out. That's pretty fair assessment, I think. Um, people tend to look to maybe Israel Finkelstein as as a titular head of the minimalist school of thought, um, and I, to an extent, I suppose that that's that's uh, correct. But I think Israel would neither Israel nor Deaver or no one is not going to is going to be able to say this isn't a proto alphabetic script. Now they right. may disagree with what it says because our problem, Derek, just in case you or your readers don't know this with that early script, it has not standardized. It can be read right to left or left to right or vertically or horizontally. And so there's a lot of room for interpretation. And so, you know, other scholars, when we release the text, they'll have to acknowledge that it's, that it's a, this archaic text, but they may say, well, but if you read it this way instead of that way, it would say this instead of that. So wow. I, mean, I think those are fair, fair criticisms. I wonder if some of the publications you guys, you know, will come out once this is peer reviewed and such, will have some of the potential explanations. If we went this way, this might mean that if we go this way, it'll mean this. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a backmasking on on rock and roll albums in the 1970s. You know, the, the whole school, <laughs> you play this album backward and it's Satan is you know? <laughs> the uh, devil's working yeah, through the yeah, Beatles. Yeah. And so, you know, if we play this text backward, maybe we get something different. <laughs> well, Dr. Shiplin, I really cannot tell you how thankful I am for your time and you giving me an opportunity to talk with you. You're a, you're a fun guy. I'd love to meet you one day, of course, learning more from you. Well, thank you, Derek. And there, you know, this kind of just hit a couple of days ago, and I know there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and ideas that are floating around. So I was happy to get the chance to talk uh, to your to your viewers and listeners so that they can sort of uh, hear it from the horse's mouth. Yeah, and I'm really I think there's more to come. And when we get more discoveries or we find out that this is public, uh, the publication comes out. I'd love to talk with you again if you have the well, time at that point. And yeah. uh, one last thing, I'm only giving you what's on the inside of the tablet. We've got writing on the outside, too. Uh-oh. Okay, so stay tuned. <laughs> I can't wait. So is there any way, um, how do people find you? Do you have a specific website you would recommend people sure. go to? Yeah, thank you for asking. I'll give you three websites. For okay. those who are interested in the Bible Seminary, where I teach, where I'm the provost and the director of the Archaeological Institute, that's thebiblesseminary.edu. And um, one of our master's degrees is biblical history and archaeology. So if people are interested in that, they can look into that. Number two, um, digshiloh.org. If they're interested in our excavation at Shiloh, it's digshiloh.org. And anyone can come volunteer, including you. I'll save you a spot. And uh, <laughs> number three, my personal website is scottstripling.net. Okay, those will be down in the description for everybody who is watching. Uh, I really appreciate you. I'm looking forward to it. Maybe I can get a voice on the other side who, who, I, I know they're not going to say it's not. Uh, you know, they're going to at least say, yeah, this is authentic. This is legit, and that's the good thing. Um, but how they are going to interpret it, it'll be interesting to hear different voices try to come at this and what they have to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, one crit criticism that you know is is in the last 48 hours is floating around, like. Why didn't these guys wait until the academic article came out? That's not right. the way. That, not the way that we do it. I mean, who, who's we, and who got to decide that you you get to decide how we want to publish our our stuff? You know, I mean, 
just yeah. lighten up a little bit. We, you don't control how we how we're going to do this, but you know, beyond that, there were reasons why we felt like we should do it now. But you know, the, you're getting into nitpicking and almost ad hominem rather than focusing on the content. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm thankful. Uh, I'm glad you came on to talk to a skeptic. Look, you're, you're you know, like. Uh, but I love you. I really do. And I'm, I'm thankful for what you've done. You've brought this. It's a great discovery. Can't wait to find more. If we're throwing away 80% of this stuff, what else are we missing? I, I, I want to find it. So yeah. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stripling. And everybody, don't forget, go down in the description. We have a Patreon. You can help support us. Go check out his websites, The Five Views of the Exodus. You can go read his first chapter. I recommend reading the whole book. You can hear everybody's views. And never forget, we are Myth Visions.